Welcome to Decode. This is the podcast where we talk all things headless WordPress and modern web development. And we're back this week with a fun episode. Um, in this one, we're going to talk all about the Gutenberg block editor in WordPress, uh, what that brings to the table, some challenges, some different approaches for working with it in a headless environment. And we have uh, the ideal guest, I think, to come on to talk about uh, all of that. And that's Jason Ball. How are you doing, Jason? Doing good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for being on with us. Uh, I'm Kellen Mace, and I am um, joined, as always, by my co-host, Will Johnston. How are you doing, Will? Pretty good. Yeah, and uh, Will and I are going to um, ask Jason some questions about uh, Gutenberg, and uh, we'll just set the stage first off um, by hearing uh, a bit about uh, Jason first. Um, so, Jason, can you tell folks, like, who are you and, and what do you do? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, name's Jason Ball. I'm a software engineer here at WP Engine, where I work on WP GraphQL, which is an open source WordPress plugin that turns your WordPress server in or WordPress site into a GraphQL server. Um, I've been working at WP Engine since February, and before that, I was doing the same thing, maintaining WP GraphQL, but was employed by Gatsby prior to that. Uh, Very yeah. nice. Um, so before we dive right into how to implement Gatsby, all or how to implement um, uh, Gutenberg and all this stuff. Let's first, you know, talk, take a step back and talk about what it is in the first place. Um, so those folks in the WordPress community, um, you almost assuredly have heard of Gutenberg uh, by now. It's uh, one of the key features that's driving WordPress forward and keeping it competitive in the uh, CMS space. And its uh, primary goal is to provide a, a really nice content authoring and editing experience. Um, pr prior to this, uh, when WordPress had a tiny MCE based content editor, um, users didn't, it, it, we called it a WYSIWYG editor, but that wasn't quite true, right? Because we still had things like short codes. Uh, so the content author, you know, they might have typed out a few paragraphs and then used this square bracket syntax to insert a short code without actually seeing what would be rendered at the end of the day. They would just have to imagine, oh, I know at this point when it shows up in the front end, it'll be our little social share widget or, or whatever it may be. Uh, so Gutenberg um, came along to save the day and uh, do away with that kind of uh, ambiguity, you know, um, and that kind of disconnectedness between what the content author or editor is seeing and what will be there, what it would look like after it gets rendered. So, so with Gutenberg, you would be able to insert a, in my example, the social share example, you'd be able to insert a social share block and actually see that block there rendered in your content um, and know what it, you know, what it will look like when it uh, gets rendered to the end user. Um, so yeah. It's a, a nice kind of real time experience. I've always considered uh, WordPress to kind of be the leading edge in terms of the publishing experience on the web. And, uh, you know, not to say that the publishing experience has always been amazing and now it's just getting even more amazing. It's just that you know, there were, there have been limitations in the past and WordPress has kind of been on the forefront of that publishing experience. That's really what they're, they've focused on. And so Gutenberg is kind of the next evolution of that. How can we bring an incredibly rich publishing experience, um, you know, to people who are not developers and, and have them feel like they ha do have some control over the look and feel of, uh, of their site. That's more than just put a header here and put a, a you know, new paragraph here and then that kind of thing. Right. And, and Jason, you're a Gutenberg user yourself. You, you've mentioned to us that you use it on like the WPGraphQL.com site, for example. So like, what are the things that you appreciate? What do you think it brings to the table? That's a real benefit. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, uh, structuring your content in individual blocks is nice compared to one big long form, tiny MCE editor. Um, it is nice. Um, yeah, like, and then, and there's some really cool like editing features that like I miss it when I'm using other applications. Like uh, when you paste the URL onto, you, you can highlight a piece of text and then yes. paste a link or a URL and it'll make it a link for you. And then I'll do the same thing in like a Google Doc and I'm like, ah, I thought this was just like yeah. how the web works now, you know, because I'm so used to it. <laughs> right. And so there's some cool stuff and. Like you see some patterns existing in other software now, like Notion, for example, has 
a similar block type editor with the slash command and you can see other types of stuff you can put in. Um, and so, you know, like we're seeing this pattern come out elsewhere on the web too. Mm -hmm. And thinking of your content as like individual things, even advanced custom fields has been doing this for a long time with uh, flex fields and yep. a little bit different way, but the same concept, right? You can, you can define flexible groups of field inputs and drag and drop them and stuff. And Gutenberg to me is just like a fresh approach of doing what ACF already popularized. Yeah. Something I think that's interesting that comes up a, a fair amount is, um, you know, there are plenty of content management systems that are markdown based or, uh, MDX is like the new, new markdown based thing where you can have some components built into your markdown page that are custom. Uh, and I think that the important distinction that I always make between that and WordPress is like when if you as a developer think that that's a great editing experience, that's one thing, right? But if you go to a publisher and you're trying to get them to write MDX and you're like, yeah, well, you have to make sure that the Chevron goes here and then you have to make sure that, you know, there's no space between the equals and the quote and like stuff like that. Uh, that kind of stuff is sometimes a foreign language to somebody who just wants to write blog posts or, or you know, like customize mm -hmm. a page, the content on a page. So uh, Gutenberg, I applaud WordPress for taking the route of something like a Gutenberg that's really trying to focus on that rich editing experience and less so on the, uh, well, you know, everyone just needs to learn a new syntax, right? It feels like mm. the short codes, uh, the short codes was a syntax that we had to deal with for a long uh, period of time that everyone kind of knew and there were helpers to help people, but uh, Gutenberg is kind of taking that to the next level. Mm hmm yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, for as many benefits as WordPress brings to the table for for this rich content uh, authoring and editing experience, um, it uh, does have its share of challenges, particularly when uh, working with decoupled applications. I, I think right now um, the assumption is that you know sites uh, sites using WordPress will be uh, um, the traditional monolithic stack and that Gutenberg will be able to output it, its markup, all of its styles um, on, onto the front end. And that data, uh, you know, the, the, the data, the need wouldn't arise to be able to pull that data out um, and send it somewhere else as structured data to be rendered in, a, in another application, um, which provides some challenges if you're in the world that, that uh, Will and I and Jason too are in of, of doing you know, these decoupled um, architectures for websites. Yeah. So I have a, before we go any further, I have a point there. And I'm not yep. going to say this just because we have Jason Ball on the, the podcast, but I, I'm i trying to think of how uh, of these limitations, which we'll get into of, of Gutenberg. And I just think about how um, many people consider like WP GraphQL synonymous with WordPress, especially if they're building headless applications. But it, it is a separate thing. Like you have to install... WP GraphQL. And in my opinion, uh, if you are not using WP GraphQL, then you're probably not, or, or maybe there's another plugin, but like using the REST API for a headless site is not a great experience. And so you want to use something like WP GraphQL, but given that it's not like part of what Core is working on, their consideration is how can we uh, work with more traditional sites because that's what WordPress enables out of the box very well, right? It's not, the REST API is clearly not focused on headless sites, right? It's focused on, well, if you have to get data out, you can. That, that seems like where it, uh, where it is right now. Yeah. Yeah. So Jason, like on this topic of uh, the challenges that exist, um, you wrote a great blog post uh, in March of 2021 called Gutenberg and Decoupled Applications. And you have this great analogy about replacing the lock on your door and how you can't, you know, there, there's an agreement about how, you know, how uh, the door looks and how the latch works and latch looks or whatever. And if you order or the parts that are meant to go with one another, there's a contract there that both sides adhere to, right? And you relate that to um, a client server um, relationship or, you know, a, a agreement, um, and how that in, in your view is, is lacking at this point, 
with Gutenberg. So can you like summarize that post for us? Like what are the, what's missing? What are the challenges there? Uh, sure. I'll, I'll try my best to be short, but <laughs> uh, yeah. So in, in WordPress, a lot of, a lot of things in WordPress have like what are called server registries, right? Like two of the most common constructs in WordPress are post types and taxonomies. So we can, as developers, we can register custom post types like house or car or whatever it might be. And you can then manage content of that type in WordPress. And then plugins can read that registry and do stuff with it. Like the REST API, for example, will read that registry and create REST endpoints for those post types. And, uh, and then plugins can do all sorts of stuff with it. You'll have permalinks built off of that registry. Um, you'll have all sorts of stuff that this registry enables. It's like the source of truth of what, what defines your types of data in WordPress. And Gutenberg comes along and um, introduces blocks, but never introduced a full-on registry concept for blocks. There's like a block registry junior, I would call it. Like you, you <laughs> register a block and then you just say where the JavaScript is for the block and you don't actually define anything about it. You don't, you don't name the block. You don't see what attributes it can or cannot have. Um, so you just, you basically tell WordPress, Hey, this block exists and here's the JavaScript for it. Have fun. And then the, the only way to interact with the block then is to be in a client that knows how to execute and, uh, you know, render JavaScript. And so for our server APIs like WP GraphQL or the native WordPress REST API or WordPress WP CLI or the XML RPC API, which, uh, is core to WordPress as well. Those APIs don't know anything about blocks. They, they're PHP APIs that don't execute and render JavaScript. Um, so uh, for these APIs to enable folks to interact with blocks from outside of native WordPress environment is very difficult. Um, because yeah, you don't even know the name of the block. You don't know the type of block. You don't know what fields the block might have, what, what users can implement or, you know, interact with the block or can't like, uh, so all this logic is left up to JavaScript. And if you're building, let's say something that can't be done in PHP, like a native iOS app, uh, you have to communicate with WordPress via API. And, um, if the APIs have no knowledge of the blocks, it gets very difficult for you to interact with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you're speaking generally about any decoupled application. Um, yeah, for for WordPress sites specifically, you, you know what that looks like in practice for them would be, you know, if if I want to fire off a GraphQL request and and um, I want the GraphQL schema to have knowledge about well what blo blocks exist and what kind of attributes exist on those, it it doesn't have that data available on the server to build out the schema, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. All right. And there are um, there's uh, a workaround to to that um, with a, a GraphQL WP GraphQL extension that we'll get into a, a bit later. But if we're just talking about you know native WordPress core, that's um, kind of the state of things. You don't have the full picture for Gutenberg blocks uh, at this stage. Um, so what uh, what changes then would need to be made to WordPress core slash Gutenberg for it to be um, fully usable in decoupled applications? Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't know if we'll ever see a point where like this friction is like completely eliminated, but I think it can mm -hmm. be reduced quite a bit. Um, and I think a, a more robust server registry would do everybody a service, um, not just headless WordPress developers, like is anybody who wants to understand how a block is built, if there was a source of truth on the server that said, here's how a block is defined, I think it would benefit a lot of the ecosystem in there's a Gutenberg uh, issue. I think issue number 2751 on GitHub on the Gutenberg GitHub repo. And I wrote like kind of a book about server registries and it's referenced in my blog post as well. Um, I love but how I, you I talk, the number. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, this is like four years ago too. I think it was September, 2017 when I wrote that. 
Um, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, I talk about how, like, if, if blocks were defined in a, you know, predictable way, much like post types and taxonomies are, uh, we can enable, like, potentially even different versions of the block editor, right? Like, we already have a bunch of block editors out there, right? Elementor is a yep. block editor. It, mm. They call them elements. And you have Divi, which calls them, I think, modules. But they're all blocks, right? They're the same thing. They're these pieces of content that you can drag and drop. Yeah. If we defined, like, if WordPress said, hey, here's a, how a block is defined, then all these other plugins could use core blocks, but just have different opinion on the UI. Like Elementor mm -hmm. has like the left and right sidebar, similar, I think, to Gutenberg in some ways. Elementor has that concept. Yeah. Divi has like all his modals, right? Everything is in a modal. Like, and some people love that. Some people like the Elementor sidebar. Like they're just different opinions on the same concept of like I'm editing a block of content. So if we, if we, if we define blocks as like a specification, like here's how you define a block to WordPress, then we could enable these other plugins to like use the same core technology, yeah. but like just have different opinion on the UI, right? And that's all we're doing with headless WordPress or even themes in WordPress, right? Like we're all using core WordPress stuff, but we're just like reimagining the visualization of the same things, right? Mm -hmm. If I activate a different thing, a different theme, I'm using the same content from WordPress. It just looks different now. Yeah, I, I think mean, we could do the I, same with blocks if if it had a registry. Yeah, I think that that's kind of how. Uh, so earlier I mentioned MDX, and and MDX is not great from a publishing standpoint, but it does leave it up to the developer on the front end to determine how everything looks, right? And that's and so it, it empowers the front end rather than saying, hey, the back end is going to dictate exactly what you have to put on your site, right? And that's and I think that's kind of where um you know there's a struggle with Gutenberg right now. And there's a lot of innovation that can happen to make it nicer registries that that type of stuff is it would go a long way. And that's really what you, all that you need to make it a great experience. Um, and then you can evolve from there. Yeah. And some of it, some of it is like, even like debugging tools and stuff would be handy, right? Like if, yeah. if yeah. I'm trying to debug something in my WordPress, like I can just run a function, like get post types and just see quickly what, what post types are being registered across all the plugins and everything that, are active and maybe find some bug there. I can say get taxonomies or whatever. I can't say like get blocks and get all my blocks. There has been some progress and we'll, we can get to that. But, hmm. um, but yeah, there's a, yeah, there, you're just like lacking a lot of information to make blocks useful outside of the single JavaScript application that is Gutenberg today. Hmm. Yeah, and in terms of the progress that has been made, uh, you mentioned, um, one thing I'm aware of is the block.json file, right? So that provides at least some data about the core blocks. Like, like uh, tell, me, tell me this, like, would it be possible um, in WP GraphQL to add to the schema a list of the blocks in like just the names, nothing else? You know uh, yeah, that? now it would be now, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, and I think it was sometime last year they did start, uh, the Gutenberg core team did start migrating uh, some of the block registry out of purely JavaScript files and into some JSON files, which can then be read by the PHP server and mm -hmm. uh, the JavaScript client. Um, so some data of blocks are now available to the WordPress server where previously almost yep. no data was available. So it is possible now there is a, uh, block registry class that you can call and get registered blocks in PHP on the PHP server. And you can get some data about the blocks, like mm -hmm. the block name and some other information, some attribute data um, as well. So we're, there is some progress, but it's still missing a lot of information that makes it useful. Like there's yeah. no, uh, there's no information on whether a block can have children blocks like, can it, is it a nestable block? Like, can you put other blocks inside of it? Can it be a child of another block? Like there's all these like rules that are like left out. Um, 
-hmm. We're like in WordPress block, uh, like the post type registry and taxonomy registry, like you can define whether a type is hierarchical or not, or, right. you know, things like that. And um, that, and you can define like whether taxonomy is related to post type or many post types, things like that. And there's a lack of that information in the registry still. So exposing blocks to something like even REST or WP GraphQL or CLI or whatever, there's still missing information to make it useful for a decoupled application developer. Yeah. Um, like you'll be like, cool, I know all these blocks exist, but I don't know if they can exist in relationship to each other, within each other, can it nest another one? Like, so there's a lot of stuff that's missing um, to make it useful. Like the REST right. API has also, since the block JSON stuff came in, the REST API started exposing some block data as well. But again, it's like, if you actually look at it and try and do something with it, you're like, I don't have enough information to do something useful here. Like, cool, you gave me this data, but what can I actually right. do with it? Do you know um, what the motivation was? Like, why did they move some of that data into the block.json files? My understanding, and I might not be, I might not have all the full picture here, but they, WordPress.org, I believe, has been working on like a cloud registry or whatever, like a block registry in, like you have the theme and plugin repo on WordPress.org. They right, wanted yeah. a block repo, I guess, up there. Oh, makes sense. And yes. for the block repo to be able to understand <laughs> your block, it needed the server to be able to understand your block a little bit. Yeah. And so I, my understanding is if you want to be included in the block repository on WordPress.org, your block would have to have a block.json with at least makes... some minimal amount of information. <laughs> um, and so I think that, I believe that was the motivation was uh, to have that registry on or the, that repo. I see. Um, it, it, so, it, seems, it seems like that's what would need to happen, right? For uh, so there need to be some kind of motivator for a change like that to happen. Like right now, um, Automatic, who owns uh, WordPress.com and, of course, has a huge influence over the open source WordPress project. Right now, I, you know, Jason, you and I have talked before about how their own, uh, the WordPress.com uh, iOS and Android apps, they can't, you know, they're, they're, yeah. uh, they could not be used for um, creating or editing a post that uses the Gutenberg editor. You know, the best, the only thing they could do is say, oh, we'll go over here and open a browser and make you log into the browser. And then from there, you could actually edit your post. But inside of those client side apps, they can't do it. Likewise with the, um, the Calypso desktop application that uh, WordPress.com has, you can't there either. But that must not be painful enough for you know, the automatic folks to, to, to you know, put some effort behind it and say, all right, you know, all the contributors that we're putting on the project this is now a priority, have a server-side register so that we can register them. those clients. Like, I don't think they probably don't care enough to do it like right at this moment. Yeah, and I mean, we can get into probably some more philosophical debates too. Like you, you all talked about like the Matt versus Matt debate. Right. Uh, right. And I think, I think some of it is right. Like um, headless WordPress is a threat to WordPress because a headless WordPress site doesn't count toward the stats of, the 40 plus percent of the web running WordPress. Oh, right. And True. so while technically that site is using WordPress, it's not reported as using WordPress. And so I, I think there might be some philosophical stuff behind the scenes on why there's some apprehension to supporting the headless WordPress community by the core team. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about it in terms of the count. I know I've heard Matt make um, public comments before about how he doesn't have an issue with it if it's uh, the right architectural choice for the project. You know, I've heard him say in interviews, yeah, throughout the years, WordPress has needed to output its data in a number of ways. So we've outputted data in the form of an RSS feed, in the form of XML data, in the form of a REST API, and now with WP GraphQL in another form. That's no problem. Like WordPress's strength lies in you know, the content authoring and editing uh, experience it brings to the table and outputting in different, you know, data in different ways. Um, you know, those kind, kinds of things can, can come and go. And WordPress still has its value proposition. It still, still remains intact. Um, so there's that part of it. But, but yeah, I hadn't thought about it in terms of the, uh, the counts, right? And that- And I mean, I don't have evidence that that's anything. It's just 
theory, but it makes sense to me is like, yeah, you have a lot of users that want to do this and, uh, right. But yeah. So for our listeners, you know, presumably if you're listening to our show, um, you have some interest in, in headless WordPress using it as a headless CMS. So let's talk next about, uh, what approaches exist, um, for doing that. Um, as of the date of uh, this recording, I've, I've written a few blog posts and re released a few videos. So head over to developers.wpengine.com um, if you want to see what implementing those uh, some of these approaches looks like in practice. Uh, here on the podcast, though, let's just talk about them uh, on a high level, just what the approaches are um, and some of the pros and cons uh, and so on. And then what our favorites <laughs> are, favorite approaches. Uh, so let's dive into that now. The first one I can think of is don't use Gutenberg. I say that kind of tongue in cheek. Uh, that would be an option, right? Uh, Jason had mentioned earlier um, something like advanced custom fields, flexible content fields. You know, there have been many a site that have successfully, you know, used um, flexible content fields and ACF field groups. You know, and that allows allowed the content editors enough control to be able to compose, you know, what they need to on a per page basis and. Uh, so you could, you know, opt for, for something, um, something like that. Uh, I don't think that's a real solution though. That's kind of a cheat, cheating answer because Gutenberg is, as we mentioned, brings a lot of benefits to the table and is being heralded as, you know, the, the big driver, uh, in, in WordPress. Well, yeah, that, and you, you want to be able to use the native features of WordPress as much as possible. So you don't want right. to have to turn off half of the features of WordPress to, <laughs> right. uh, to build your site. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, with that kind of cheating uh, response out of the way, let's get into a few real approaches here. Um, the, the first one uh, I, I have is rendering blocks as HTML. So for this one, uh, it's possible via the REST API or via WP GraphQL to get back the fully rendered HTML um, that uh, is produced by you know, composing all the Gutenberg blocks to, together and, um, and you know, running, running the post content through a few filters so that it's ready to be displayed to the user. Uh, so that's possible right now. You can get um, that whole blob of HTML and you can choose to uh, render that to the page. Um, in, my, uh, in my blog post and in videos, I, I show how to do that in a Next.js app. So you could use the um, dangerously set inner HTML escape hatch that React provides to you know, render that, uh, that data to the page. So that'd be one example of doing that. Um, there's some trade-offs with that approach though. Uh, and that's, from what I understand, that's um, the approach that you use, Jason, on the wpgraphql.com site, for example. Yeah. Like, how do, you, how do you like that approach? Does it work out? Are there pain points with it? Yeah, I think um, as the only, like as the primary contributor to the front-end code base and the primary user on the back-end, uh, it, it works okay because I can predict what the inputs are and what the outputs are going to be. Um, so for small, small teams, I think, or really small teams in my case, right. uh, I think it works okay. Cause I, I know, I know both sides. Right. Um, so if I, yeah. if I decide to enable a new block on the back end, I know what block I need to support on the front end. Um, mm -hmm. And if I ever, if I update the, that block plugin, I can see what changes were made to that block. And if I need to change something on the front end to support those changes, I can do it because I control both sides. Um, if you're working on, on a larger agency or an internal team, you know, where internal company with, you know, bigger teams or whatever, like the newspaper I worked at when WP GraphQL started, I was on the WordPress team, but we had yeah. a mobile team. We had a data team that was consuming data out of WordPress that, and they didn't know anything about WordPress. They interacted with APIs. Um, so we had to be obviously a lot more careful on, uh, you know, what, what we introduced and how it impacted their consumption of the data. Um, so if you're in a bigger team or, or, you know, even, even just a multi-person team, um, or, or a team where the publisher has some control over installing things or whatever, um, yeah. it can get real tricky because all of a sudden an unpredictable input or an input that you didn't plan on happening, like a HTML being rendered that you weren't planning on mm. could potentially break your front end or at least cause some output you weren't ready for. 
which yeah. may or may not appear as broken. Um, yeah, I think that it's it really is like it. If you have two separate teams or or two separate people, one working on the WordPress side and the other working on whatever front end or multiple front ends, then there's always room for well, if you know a block got added on the uh, WordPress side and the front end wasn't ready for it, and now we've got a wonky experience when we're trying to render this HTML. And honestly, like this isn't only a headless WordPress issue. Like if you update a block, uh, like, so the way WordPress, the way Gutenberg stores blocks is in like HTML with HTML comments. And if you were to update the definition of your block uh, to no longer meet the requirements of your old HTML from your old blog posts, even in normal monolithic WordPress, you can have problems right um yeah so uh, because again there's like even between the gutenberg application that ships with core and the data that's stored in wordpress there's not even that contract that i talk about in my blog post and this is in wordpress core itself this isn't just like a wp graphql thing this is wordpress the gutenberg javascript application doesn't have a contract with the wordpress server in wordpress core mm -hmm. to be able to resolve those conflicts and say hey pal you know and they've done stuff in the client to at least bring it to your attention. Like if you open a blog post and Gutenberg, you're on a post that has old shape of block, it will tell you something's wrong. But sometimes it can be like really scary. You're like, oh crap, what did I <laughs> like? I just ruined my website. Uh, it looks scary. Yeah. Like you come across and, it. And actually the same issue uh, exists in MDX. So when people are building MDX sites, if you, uh, if I'm the publisher and I go out and I, I'm like researching, you know, I want to include something in my MDX file and I, I can see a little snippet of code and I'm just like, oh, okay, I'll just put that snippet of code in my site. Uh, and it has a component that isn't accounted for on the front end, then yeah, now you have uh, a, right. a site that's not rendering properly. And that can very easily happen even in the uh, the MDX world. So it's like, the, it, hmm. it isn't just a, a, a decoupled or a headless WordPress issue. It's also a traditional WordPress issue. And then it's also conceptually an issue with many other uh content management systems and um and the like yeah so for the listeners out there who are worried about that like the unpredictability i would say you could you can mitigate that a little bit by using a filter that wordpress provides for uh controlling like which blocks your content creators are allowed to use so that would give you some protection there because then they wouldn't be able to install some plugin that provides a bunch of third-party blocks without you knowing and then just using those right off the bat, you know? So you could choose to use the um, the allowed blocks uh, uh, filter for yep. Gutenberg and say, I'm only you know locking it down to core blocks or the third-party blocks that I know about and have approved or whatever else. So, so that'd be yeah, one way of kind of making yeah. things. That's probably the... Yeah, the best recommendation for now, if you're working on a bigger team, is you just you set a contract with the teams that need to use it and say, here's here's the list, and we'll maintain this list. And if we have to update this list, we'll notify you about it and how it might impact things. Yep. Uh, that's assuming yep. you know who your consumers are too, because there are like I can go consume the post status REST API today and they're not going to be able to notify me <laughs> easily. They're like, hey, we just broke your consuming application um, yeah right so it works for teams where you know where you know the teams work on yeah. both sides yeah so this um this approach uh does the trick you can get all the uh you know fully rendered html that represents the post content and render that to your page um you'll need to do a few tweaks to it so my blog post and video i talk about uh implementing a filter just to correct like the internal links um instead of pointing to your wordpress backend you instead want those to point to you know, the corresponding site on your decoupled front end site. Um, so it's pretty easy to do to implement a filter there. And there's even some customization you can do in the form of using a JavaScript based HTML parser. Um, so it's possible to, if you need to, uh, to swap out some of the uh, React elements uh, on, on the page or some of the elements I should say on the page with a component. So it could be a, a React or Vue or Svelte or whatever yeah. component. So like Jason, I think you do this for a few things at WP GraphQL, like the Twitter embed, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, I've, right. uh, yeah Twitter embeds and some other, I think YouTube embeds or something like that as well. And then mm. uh, code snippets as well. Um, like 
if it's a code snippet in Gutenberg, then I convert it to like a nice, pretty formatted code snippet on the front end where you can copy the code and things like that. Yeah. Um, and it shows what language the snippet is, like if it's PHP or JavaScript or whatever. Um, but yeah, so I'm using the, the actual HTML as my API there and I parse the HTML and figure out, oh, is this a code block? Then I should render it differently. Mm. Um, some of the tricks with that is like, uh, like Gutenberg stores a lot of meta information in the block attributes, which are HTML comments, and those don't come for the ride um, in, right. in your HTML. So for me, I've had to pass some attributes as data attributes in HTML, which is like, we're getting like kind of old school, like <laughs> yeah. kind of why I think why a lot of people have like migrated to React was to get away from using the DOM as the API. And here we yeah. are <laughs> using the DOM as the API. True. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's, but it's workable. Yeah, so yeah, it is. For, for, so for the listeners out there, a common use case um, would be for like a link component. So this would be like, if I have a Next.js app, even though I've implemented the filter that I mentioned to rewrite the links to point to the right you know, front end page, uh, when the user clicks that, it's still a plain old anchor link. So they would they would then get a full page reload, uh, which in a single page app framework is generally not what you want. You know what you want is to use the uh, the router that the framework comes with. So it would be possible, like using a an uh, HTML parser, like we're talking about, to identify like where internal links are, and then swap those out with a you know the link component that your framework provides. So then when the user clicks that, they would get that you know immediate cut over to the next page using the built-in router. Um, so that could be used, you know, for link components, but also other things, you know, as Jason mentioned, uh, the um, embedded code code blocks or, or Twitter embeds or things like that. So, uh, so it's good news. You get some flexibility there. One last note on styling here. Uh, WordPress does have um, three uh, CSS files that you can, you know, choose to in install if you want. And, and there's styles that, uh, there's style sheets that provide base styles for Gutenberg blocks. So it gives you some of the base like alignment and things like that um, for free. So you could choose to write the styles like from the ground up uh, yourself if, if you want uh, that level of control. But otherwise, if you want the base styles, that's an option. You could choose to include those as well. I do want to throw out one possible warning on using those. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but those are GPL and GPL is an infectious yeah. license. <laughs> and so any, if you use any of those GPL scripts in your project, it carries over to your entire project, which means your entire project would have to be licensed as GPL. Yeah. I don't know if that, I know in WordPress core pre Gutenberg JavaScript and CSS was not GPL, but the right. Gutenberg NPM, anything in Gutenberg NPM registry has been published as GPL, which, and anytime you distribute GPL based code, which you do with JavaScript applications that could download to the user's browser, you're distributing it. It means you have to publish your whole project as GPL. So just a warning, right. I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding <laughs> of GPL is that your entire project would have to be GPL, which means you would have to release the code if yeah. someone asked. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good thing to note there for anybody. Uh, uh, again, I'm not that. a lawyer, so talk to an actual lawyer before you. Sure make official business decisions on that. Yeah. All right. So back to our uh, approaches, we talked about the um, one uh, vi viable one, I would say, and that is rendering blocks as HTML. Um, another one is to use uh, the Gutenberg object plugin. Um, this one, I would, I would say, you know, I would only consider this one if I had to use the REST API personally, like if I was working on some government site or something they said no third-party plugins just you can only work with you know what's in wordpress core uh then i would give this um option some some thought um but there's some issues with it like uh un un unpredictable data and the response and so on and uh, i'm just a, a fan of um using you know graphql as my data layer in the first place so i would opt for uh the next option on our list and that is using the wp graphql gutenberg extension so Jason, you want to like give a little blurb for what does that extension do? Yeah, so WP GraphQL Gutenberg, I don't maintain it, but I'm mm. talk with Peter who does maintain it a bit. And uh, so what that does, but you install that, 
it has a settings page that you can go to and click a button that loads Gutenberg in an iframe, executes the JavaScript to get the registry from the Gutenberg JavaScript application, sends the block registry from JavaScript down to the WordPress yeah. server and stores it in an options table and then uses the, the registry as uh, to map to the WP GraphQL schema. Um, it, it's work and the so then you have all your blocks as GraphQL object types and you can browse the graphical documentation and like search for blocks and see what attributes your blocks have. Yeah. And then you can write like GraphQL query fragments for your blocks and build component. Like it's, it gets you close to like what I think is possibly ideal for using Gutenberg with WP GraphQL. Um, yeah. The biggest trade-off and why, like I can't, personally like put my stamp of approval on it as like a WP GraphQL core maintainer is that it relies on the iframe JavaScript implementation. So Gutenberg, cause that doesn't scale. Um, Gutenberg, mm. you, like you've mentioned, you have the allowed blocks filter. Well, you can yeah. allow different blocks on different post types or even on different individual posts, right? Yeah. You can say, if this is the home page, you allow the home page blocks. If it's the about page, allow the about page blocks. If it's the product right. post type, allow the WooCommerce blocks. You know, so um, every single page on your site might have the ability to have different blocks. And so what that does, it loads up just one page, gets the registry for that page and hopes it's the right one. Um, which again, for small projects, if you have blocks globally enabled for every page on your site, every post type in my work um, for sites where you do have it like a more conditional experience. The mm -hmm. first Gutenberg site I ever worked on two years before Gutenberg was in core, I had these limitations already where I had to have different yeah. post types and templates with different blocks. So I know it's a very real scenario because I, the first site I ever got <laughs> paid to work on with Gutenberg had that yeah. expectation. And uh, so I know a lot of sites out there have expectations like that um, yeah. where you have different templates, different blocks, different whatever. And so WP GraphQL for Gutenberg doesn't scale for that situation. And uh, so I think you'd end up loading the block registry and you'd be like, where the heck is block, you know, they about us block or the homepage block. Like it wouldn't be there and you would think something was broken. Um, so the way around that, you'd have to have it, load Gutenberg for every single page of your site and then like get a copy of the registry for every single page and then somehow merge it or something. Right. Like how long it, would that take for a big site? Like it, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And, and all of this is a workaround, right? Because the, yeah. the, that, yeah. that's that because the server, server registry site registry doesn't, doesn't exist. exist. Yeah. The plugins, you know, doing yeah. this as, as a workaround. So it's not that it's uh, poorly written, right? It's just like, that's yeah, the, no, that's it's the not, not of, a knock on Peter. It was genius idea yeah. from peter yeah that's just the nature of uh lack of server registry and yeah have, having to get it from executing javascript what yeah. if you you could maintain a page that's not a front-end page that just has all the blocks enabled so it could be like the one that you direct the plug into could you do something like so that? you could potentially but then uh one of the awesome features of graphql is that the schema serves as documentation yeah. and uh I'm maybe a bit of an idealist with it, but like, I like to only expose in the schema what's actually possible. And if I yeah. know, if I know that when you query the about page, the only five blocks available to this page are the five about us blocks, I would like to expose that as a, as your possibilities. Where sure. if, if you had every single possible block, you know, then the front end developer is like, oh, when I'm building the about page, I need to support 400,000 blocks, right? Like, or, you know, it, yeah. probably not that many, but it would probably be in the many dozens at least on most yeah. sites. Um, and so that, that gets complicated as a client developer, where if they could say, hey, you're tasked with building an about us page, you could go to graphical, look at about us, look at the blocks available and see, oh, there are maybe a hundred possible blocks, but for this page, there's five. Um, yeah. And now that, that's a, that would just like the experience I want to get to is where the server can say, here's all the possible blocks. And then in these contexts, like querying the post post type or the page post type, here's the possible blocks for that post type. 
And then further, I wanted to be able to say like, oh, the attributes, okay, there's a color attribute and the possible values are red, green, and blue. And then we can do further validation. Like if somebody tries to do something with the pink, you can say, sorry, pal, that's not possible. Um, but we'd have to get further with the registry and say like, okay, we have attributes, but here's the possible values of the attributes or here's the validation rules for the attributes. And, and that all doesn't exist in the blocks JSON registry either. Yeah. So, um, so after having gone through all the approaches, uh, let's talk about like, what do you think is the best choice for most sites? Um, I can tell you my, my take, I think uh, using uh, the approach where you render, render blocks as HTML and possibly even include the, um, the style sheets uh, is the easiest to implement. Um, but it, that ease of implementation comes at a cost and that is uh, a bit less control. You know, so if you want to be able to uh, control exactly what, you know, markup gets rendered and exact, you know, uh, do, style everything from, from the ground up and render React components maybe that maintain their own internal state or make a network request or any of this uh, fancy stuff, you, would, you won't quite be able to do that, or at least it'll be more cumbersome to try to do that with an HTML parser. So if you need, if you want, you know, very fine-grained control like that, then you might want to look at the WP GraphQL Gutenberg approach. Um, if you don't, though, if, if, you know, just making the few tweaks I mentioned to make sure links point to the right places and, uh, and things like that, if that, you know, would work for your project and maybe a few other tweaks like the Twitter embed and swapping out a few blocks, if that's uh, good enough, I would say like rendering blocks as HTML, HTML is probably the um, the one with the you know lowest um, barrier or the least least friction to implement. Um, Jason, like, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think today I would follow that recommendation. I would like I am today rendering as HTML and parsing it and doing stuff there. And to me, that that's the most scalable approach. Um, uh, but yeah, ideally, I would like to get to a point in the not too distant future where we can eat, whether it's working with the Gutenberg core team more closely, if they'll have it, or us just figuring out our own stuff um, where we do use the blocks JSON, make sure it has enough information we need, like whether a block can be nested or not. And, you know, things, things about attributes that we would need to expose. Ideally, I'd like to get to that point where we can let the server registry be the source of truth. Uh, map that to GraphQL and then do stuff like I mentioned, like where we can expose what blocks are possible on post type A versus post type B versus post type C um, and other contexts like menus now and widgets and things like that are all block enabled. So which all have different possible blocks. Right. Um, so I'd like to get to that point. And then we could use GraphQL as like, uh, you know, documentation for what's possible and then client developers can browse that without having to even know anything about WordPress and, and know what, what blocks are possible, what blocks they need to have components for, um, what fields are possible on each block and things like that. That's ideally where I want to get to, but some work to be done. Yeah. Yeah. I hope we get there. Uh, that'd be cool. Um, in the meantime, though, uh, hopefully folks, you know, can, um, have their needs met with the approaches that are available. Uh, so again, check out our developers.wpng.com site for more info on kind of how to implement some of the options that exist right now. Um, so with that, we'll uh, wrap things up. Uh, we just want to first off, like, thank you, Jason, for taking the time to educate everybody about um, the state of working with Gutenberg in, you know, decoupled applications and talking through uh, some of the challenges and our favorite approaches and things like that. Um, thank you everybody for, uh, for listening and we will catch you in the next episode. Thanks.